wanted to make a kid's book probably as long as I've been an illustrator. Uh, I've always liked storytelling with my pictures and I made comic books and short cartoons. And the kid's book just seemed like a really fun format to try. But I never really had a story that excited me enough to take the time to make the book. I have two daughters and I went through that stage that a lot of parents go through when you're reading bedtime stories to them every night, sometimes two or three short books. And I feel like I had a sort of boot camp in children's stories then. And I realized how much I loved the good ones and how much I hated reading the bad ones. And how important it was as a family, this kind of bedtime story ritual. And that's what got me excited about finally uh, committing to doing a story of my own. And the, the fairy tale which I, I wrote, the, the Little Wooden Robot and the Log Princess, kind of came about through our family. My younger daughter is, ever since she was a baby, she sleeps like a log every night. She closes her eyes, she sleeps, and she wakes up refreshed in the morning, and almost nothing will wake her up in between. So we called her the log. And it was a kind of family joke. And then one night I was, as I occasionally did at the time, making up a bedtime story for the girls and just improvising it. And I came up with this story about a little princess who, when she falls asleep, turns into a log. So I sort of began the project by accident in that sort of 10 minute piece of improvisation. And the girls liked the story and I told it to them a few more times and we talked about what they liked about it. So the project sort of began by accident, really. Well, I think really the hardest thing was, was trying to keep what's good about my cartoons for adults or what I like about them and what I enjoy. Um, and translating that into children's world without losing what's good about them. I knew that a children's story couldn't be as, as dry and maybe as subtle in, in the same ways as my adult cartoons. And the humor would have to be a different type of humor, which could be enjoyed by a, a small child as well as an adult. So really finding a way to, to I suppose, warm up some of the, the coolness which is in my adult cartooning without feeling like I poured a bucket of icing sugar over the top of it and without it becoming something saccharine and losing some of the charm that I hope's in my, in my adult work. So I tried to keep the drawing style quite similar to my adult cartooning, but in an adult cartoon, I might simplify a face down to just a pair of eyes on a circle. It could be as simple as that. But... For a child, I think they need more than that. So there was more smiley faces. There were slightly warmer colors than I'd have naturally used. And, and that was a, was a challenge, but I, I really enjoyed working in this new form. What I had in mind was the form, which in my mind was the bedtime story, that the story that's read by a parent or another caregiver to a tired child at the end of the day. And it's almost a sort of ritual of ending the day and going to sleep. And I wanted to write a story which fitted that, the kind of age when a child probably isn't reading to themselves and maybe can read, but still has this being told one story at bedtime. And I really wanted to make a story which would work in that sort of space. So my story has, you know, tiredness in it and, and the, the, the princess falls asleep. So it's, it's sort of very much thinking about that space in which it's told, which is a, a lovely sort of intimate moment in a family's life. And it's, it's interesting to be making something to fit into people's lives there. Yes, well, that's something I think if I'd written a book before I'd had children, I, I wouldn't have understood so clearly that unlike a comic book, which one reads to oneself and all the story comes together in your mind silently, a children's book is very much a, 
it's a the text is a script for a performance by a generally unskilled and perhaps tired actor who is the the reader so it very much has to sound good in the mouth in a way that um a comic book doesn't so much so i i i really wanted it to work well and and to be easily readable so i would take drafts of the story home and I'd read it to my children and I'd have my wife who's a much better story reader than me read it to the three of us and I'd listen to see what was working and what wasn't working. I didn't dumb down the language in any way for children but I suppose I, I wanted it to sound like some of the fairy tales that I'd read as a child so I or had read to me probably more importantly. So there is some slightly old-fashioned language in there and some language that my copy editor said was quite British sounding language for an American picture book, but they were willing to let that stand because I think it fitted with the fairy tale idea and the slight old fashionedness of that type of story, which I wanted to be in there alongside my own maybe slightly stranger twists on things like having a robot and, and other things like that. <laughs> I was quite slow on this book. Between the time when I first told the story to them and the book coming out, quite a few years have passed. I, I can't remember exactly how old they were when I told the story, but I would guess that was five or six years ago. So now they're both teenagers. Iris is 13 and Daphne's 16, but they've been there for the journey of the book all along. And it's been very helpful having them, having them there at the beginning as small children who reacted quite naturally to the story to now when they've they, they've known the story all along and can help me with with elements of it so it, it's been a lovely sort of family um family project well it's funny you say that my first draft of the book was was very long and the publisher said, "This is too long. This is too long for a, for a one night bedtime story. And if you if you want it to work in that form, you need to shorten it. It was about three thousand words at that point, whereas the finished book is a little over a thousand. So I cut two thirds of it. I mean, I think it shows how overwritten the first draft was that I didn't actually lose that many things. I managed to cut out a lot of stuff that was in there which didn't do a lot, but there was one." element which I think even just last night my daughter was um, bemoaning that it, it was removed is there was a very small scene when the little wooden robot is is left in the frozen north on his own uh, and his sister is at that point a log and he's trying to find her and in my long draft he, some trolls appear and they bring him a hot sausage and a cup of tea and in my in my desperation to get the book down to, to the right length, I edited that out, which I think does help because it makes him more lonely at that point. And I also began to think, would a robot eat a sausage? And once you start thinking about these things, you can you can get in a bit of a spiral. So in the end, that scene was cut and I think it's better for it. But I don't think my younger daughter, Iris, has ever talked about the book without being sad that the, the trolls and the hot sausage are not in it. So it may be one day I have to write a book about trolls and sausages to make it up to her. Well, I wanted to have those um, short, th those suggested stories nested within the main story, so that even in this short one night, one evening story, there's a feeling of, of bigness, of a, of a a fairy tale world where there's not just this one story going on there's there's magic everywhere and there's possibilities so the, the stories are in there to help the narrative but i also hope that they will be turned into stories but not by me that the the aim of those really is to spark the imagination of the child who's being read to and i'm always i've i've had a few friends tell me that they have had discussions with their children about those, those suggested narratives. There's one of them is called The Old Lady in a Bottle. And she was saying her son was discussing, how, how's he gonna get her out of the bottle? You know, does she have some knitting in there? Can she knit a ladder to get out? And I really want those stories to, 
to happen, but I, I don't want to be the one to write them. I want them to be to happen for everyone who reads the story can imagine what's going to go on there. Well, the book is more colourful than my uh, usual work. I, I, I naturally um, move towards quite a muted palette and that's where I feel comfortable. But that was another thing my daughters told me is they, they said nobody will want to read a, no child will want to read a book which is in your usual palette. You need, you need more colour in there. And I think they were right. So that was something I worked hard on trying to keep colours that I liked, but just get that brightness and warmth is what I tried to call it and, um, and richness. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to just turn in a sort of rainbow fairy tale. So trying to find a way that I could be comfortable with more colourful work was one of the challenges. And I took home every page of the book to my family and we sat down and talked about the different colours and what needed to be brighter and what wasn't working. In terms of the, the, the race of the king and the queen and the sort of suggested race of the children, even though they're both made out of wood, uh, the, the daughter does seem to be similarly coloured to the mother. I suppose it comes down to the whole idea of taking an old form like the fairy tale, which has all these wonderful, powerful tropes and using them to tell a story today. And you can't make an old fairy tale exactly as, as the Brothers Grimm would have done set in medieval Germany, um, because it's, it's not, it's, it's now is today and that would be pointless. So I guess I was sort of looking at the tropes of fairy tales and thinking, what are the good ones? What are the powerful ones that I like? And what are the ones which you might just put in a story unthinkingly? And the idea that fairy tales are really set in medieval Germany is nonsense. You know, there's goblins, sometimes St. Peter's walking around in the forest. There's animals who can talk. So it's they're not real. And as soon as I was freed from it being not real, I thought it, it would be sad if, if anybody looked at this book and thought it was only about German or British children. So it just seemed silly not to have a diverse cast of characters. And then when you do think about, you know, when you think carefully about these tropes, you sometimes find that it, it adds up to something more interesting. And you know, kings and queens were generally people from different countries who had been married in order to cement a, a relationship between the countries. So the queen not being a sort of northern European sort of suggests the bigger world. And I think helps suggest that the when the, the little robot is lost, he's lost. He's lost in a big wide world. He's not lost in a little forest in in England or Germany or something. So sometimes questioning the tropes which have been handed down leads to something a bit more interesting. It is my first um, children's book and I don't, I don't know what an editor normally does. I only know this one single experience I have, which is both Neil Porter, uh, my editor, and Stephen Malk, my agent, and Jennifer, the designer, all had suggestions but they were all very gentle improvements rather than great big edits I'd, I'd worked on the story for quite a while before I brought it to them so I'd I'd really I didn't bring them a work in progress I, I brought something which was as finished as I felt I could make it but I was expecting to have to change things and I was willing to change things first of all I was delighted that they that after working on something on my own and with my family that I brought it to some real professionals and they, they liked it. And their suggestions were subtle, but, but very much improved it. One, one thing I, I definitely had wrong in my draft is uh, the robot woke the princess from, the sl from, from sleep with a kiss. He woke her, uh, as, as in any fairy tale, as, as, um, you know, Sleeping Beauty or Snow White. 
and to me a brother kissing his sister felt fine when I wrote the story and both um Neil and Steve said no that 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 just seems a bit odd it's not worth it um things have changed and that's a trope that you and, and I see now that's a trope that I took on from the fairy tale and didn't consider how it sounded in our world today so we changed it to some magic words which I think improved the story and also ties into fairy tales like the magic porridge pot which has magic words said to stop a porridge pot but I like the fact that I managed to find a, a different fairy tale way of solving that problem that was the only major thing and then they just little changes to the text little improvements and and they, they thought the ending needed a bit more visual excitement so that we you know we added some fireworks and the people of the country standing happily watching the end so it was a real whopper of an ending whereas my original version was maybe a little quieter <laughs> The classic fairy tales are definitely uh, a big influence on this story. And before I wrote it, I had thought perhaps, I wasn't sure I could write a children's book. And I thought a, a sort of lazy solution or an easy solution would be to find a fairy tale and illustrate it myself. So I read all of Grimm's fairy tales and a lot of other ones trying to find a fairy tale that I could edit or, or make my own. But I found generally either the, the very well-known ones, which I think it would be uninteresting to, to, um, to redo. And I didn't want to do a sort of re-envisioning, ironic take a part of a fairy tale. I read lots of Grimm's fairy tales and I was looking for one that I could adapt into a story. And either they were very well-known where I felt it had been done, or they weren't very well known, and they weren't very well known because they were absolutely terrifying, or they were really strange, or they were brilliant, but they were just weird. So I realized in the end that I was, if I wanted to do my, my own fairy tale, I was going to have to write it as well. So I was totally inspired by the wonderful titles of Grimm stories. There's one, one of my favorites is called The Mouse, the Bird and the Sausage. And it's about a, a house in the woods where a mouse and a bird and a sausage live together. And I love the, the flatness of that title. It's so ordinary, but it's got this insanity that there's a sausage living with creatures. Once I realized I was writing a fairy tale, I wanted it to have that mixture of fantasticness and also just flatness of flatly stating who these characters are, as if, as if it's perfectly normal to, to hear about these things. A writer illustrator team called Janet and Alan Alberg, and he wrote the stories and she illustrated them. And they've written, they wrote stories which I read as a child and he carried on writing stories and is still alive today and writes. And I think he's just the most wonderful writer of dialogue to be read by a parent. And he was a big influence on the way I wrote the story because some of his stories, there's one called The Runaway Dinner, which is a very, a very light, rather silly story, but it's so beautifully written lyrically that as a parent, even someone like me, who's not a great story um, actor or performer, um, that it's so well written that you, you, you can perform a delightful act for your child just by following his words and his punctuation. So he was a, he was a big influence on me. I think that probably is in there. I mean, I grew up in Scotland near Aberdeen and the village I, I lived in was literally called Woodlands of Darris. That was the name of the village. And our house was surrounded by forests. Um, and I spent a lot of time with my friends walking in the forests and playing in the forest. So when I read a Grimm's fairy tale about people wandering off into the forests, in my mind, it's those, those forests of my childhood that were behind my house and that I spent lots of time in. Well, are they getting anything? Our plan, because like everybody, we've been in lockdown and we haven't 
we haven't traveled anywhere. So the, the, the big family trip was, was to come to America and to, they, they've, they've, want, they've wanted to visit New York for a while. We're all hoping to come over and um, travel around America a little. Uh, so that's, that's their treat for being so good with the book this last, well, five years or whatever it's been. I don't think that's a, a risk. When I started this children's book, I had an idea for a graphic novel for grown-ups, and I had this children's book idea. And I, it was really, there was a point when I realized I needed to pick one. And I thought, I'll do the kids' book, and I'll do the graphic novel next. And now I'm at the stage, the kids' book is finished, and I'm doing a little publicity for it. But I, I have a new space in my life for a, a new project, and that will be a another book for adults and I'm going to keep doing my regular cartoons for um, my weekly cartoons for the new scientist and for Gu the guardian I don't have an idea for another kids book and I don't want to rush into one until I have one I feel as sure of as I did with this I'll just have to wait and see if if I do do another children's book or if or if it's just this one we'll have to see <laughs>